I'm Zach Childs and welcome to the True Tone Lounge. Today's guest got his start as a drumming electrician and after buying some rock albums, he switched to the guitar and soon found himself playing in churches and then starting a group that revolutionized Christian music. Now, of course, all good things kind of come to an end. So the band, uh, you know, kind of had its last concert in 2009, Delirious. And since then, he has been working with Michael W. Smith out on the road. And also he has a, a Project Beatitudes album, book, and film. And we're just happy to have Stu G, also a.k.a. Stu Garrard, That's on the show. So oh, that's great. Thank you, Stu. Thank you, Zach. It's great to be here. I'm really honored. And uh, yeah, you've done your homework. I'm very impressed. Well, I, you know, I, you know, I'll say I don't want to get caught with my pants down. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing worse yeah. than an interview where the guy doesn't know what he's talking about, <laughs> and and he misses all these opportunities, and and the uh, the guest is having to correct them all the time. Oh, that's, that's well, a, that's great. It's a nightmare. Uh, it's a nightmare well, for everyone. So yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Zach. <laughs> so. Let's, uh, I kind of hinted at it, but tell us kind of how you got into music. Yeah, so uh, my dad, actually, when I was growing up little, he, he like played violin a little bit and, uh, and he bought a guitar and uh, we would sing um, Home on the Range on the end of my bed at night times. I remember that. But, uh, and, um, and then, you know, I, I got into playing drums. I wanted to be a drummer. And um, I was in something called the Boys Brigade, which is a bit like the Scouts. And uh, I, I played the, the snare drum in that. And so I got, ended up getting a drum kit. And, uh, but then when I started work, I, I started work as an electrician. And uh, with my first couple of weeks wages, I'd go to the record store every week, every Friday, and, uh, and buy all of Queen al mm -hmm. Queen's albums, right? Um, until I kind of got up to date. But then I went in this one day and he said, oh, there's a new Queen album come out. And I was like, oh, really? He said, yeah, it's Queen Life Killers released today. Like, check this out. And I put on the first track and uh, it was the... I, I used to love live albums. There's something about live music that is just, you know, it keeps you on the edge of your seat sort of thing. And it just there's that sort of, uh, yeah, the edginess of it. I love it and the, and the excitement. But... Um, as soon as they went into the fast version of We Will Rock You, I knew that I wanted to be Brian May. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I went home, sold my drum kit, and uh, bought a guitar and a little five watt practice amp, and uh, um, learned um, I'm In Love With My Car by ear, and uh, then got some lessons from a local tutor, and uh, that was the beginning of it. Oh. So when did you start performing publicly? Um, well, I got together with a, uh, a few friends in the town that I was born in and raised and started working in. It's called Ipswich on the east coast of, uh, of England and uh, met some friends, and um, which is where Celestian is. That's what I was about to say. Yeah, I was about Ipswich to say, isn't, isn't yeah. that where Celestian speakers yeah. are made? Yeah, that's, that's right. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, so I met some friends who happened to be in a, uh, they happened to go to church and um, uh, we started to kind of practice in one of the guy's garages and yeah, we ended up being this little band and went out and, and, and did a few gigs and would play uh, pubs, clubs and churches and, and that's really how, how I kind of cut my teeth on the, the live thing, yeah. Now I'd also heard that you uh, you were inspired. Well, you kind of had a, a, a life changing event when you went to a Phil Keggy concert. That is correct. Oh. Yeah, a Phil. Um, so I was into guitar. You know, my uh, like talking about church. You know, um, I grew up in church, but I never really kind of um, uh, had become a Christian, if you like. And so um, I'd met my future wife at this time, and. Um, was so into guitar and my one of my friends had um, uh, actually no my brother-in-law had given me a uh, Phil Cakey album and I was like this guy's probably the best player in the world you know the best living player in the world right now in my opinion so um, we and heard that he was coming to London so we went to uh, a concert in London and uh, stayed with some friends and 
But what I didn't know about that concert was that there'd be a preacher there. And, um, um, and so, yeah, that kind of changed my life because it was that weekend that my wife and I um, decided that we'd become Christians. Yeah. That kind of changed the course of my life a little bit, actually. Yeah. Yeah. In what way? Well, um, it, in terms of career, because, like, it, um, you know, we, we uh, started to get involved in a church in London, and then they saw some kind of potential in me as a player and kind of got me out in London playing in bars and clubs and uh, just helped that path along the way that eventually led to playing with some artists in the UK, people like Noel Richards, who was a... Um, a, um, a worship leader there, and uh, but I played in a, a reggae band um, with an artist who was incredible, and he, he was Nigerian actually. But you know, Bob Marley came to him in a dream and uh, and gave him his uh, passed on his mantle to him. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but I tell you what, that reggae thing was some of the most fun music I'd, I've ever played to this day, and and something that like connects really deep. Like when you're sitting in a basement rehearsing and you're playing the same thing for ten minutes, it's really, it's really strong. Like, um, so yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it kind of you know changed my course in terms of not just spiritually for me and my wife, but also just it kind of uh, brought this kind of wider world that I got out to play in. How did the band Delirious come about? Um, well, yeah, so in the UK, obviously, we're uh, kind of a smaller island sort of country. And uh, so within like any sort of music scene, you end up uh, getting to know different people. And uh, so I would be traveling around predominantly with, uh, well, actually, I had a band called the Stuart David Band um, that was my band. And then that turned into a band called the Treasure Park. And we would be playing in London and, and around the country. Uh, so a lot of the time we'd be playing in, in pubs and music clubs like uh, the Mean Fiddler or the Borderline or um, the Marquee or, you know, some of these like really famous rock garden, famous right. sort of rock venues. Uh, but also we'd be playing in church events all around the country. And, uh, and through that, you know, you get to know a lot of the people that are doing similar things. And um, I got to meet Martin and Tim. Martin was the lead singer of Delirious. Tim was a keyboard player. Um, I got to meet them at a kind of a gathering of musicians, um, like a forum, and um, and they had just started um, a youth event in their church on the south coast um, that started with like 70 people. And it, they called it Cutting Edge. And at the same time, I was actually working with this guy who used to be in a band called After the Fire that had a massive hit in America called De Commissar in the 80s and toured with Queen and what have you. Yes. Um, and um, so Andy Piercy was helping me um, with some production stuff, and but he was also producing the Cutting Edge albums. And so, um, you know, he was always saying, oh, you need to kind of see what's going on with... Uh, Martin and the guys down on the south coast, and um, and then uh, you know we met at this this forum, and they invited me down um, to one of these events and play with them. And you know, as soon as we went down there, I came back from that first one to my wife and said, you know, something going on with these people, um, and uh, I I think it's something you should come and you know, have a look at too. At the time, they lived on the south coast, we lived in the Midlands, it was like two and a half hour drive and we went down and, you know, just had such a great connection with them and their and their local church. Um, and we ended up moving down there to go and be like fully a part of it. Like at this time, it wasn't, you know, a, uh, a band called Delirious, it was just this team that was playing at this event for kids once a month on a Sunday and, um, it actually meant that I kind of had to go back to being an electrician for a little while right. um, just to make ends meet, you know. But the I enjoyed, there was nowhere else I'd rather be, you know. Like, um, I really loved the fact of what we were doing once a month and that was what I wanted to be doing. So it, so the fact that I had to uh, sort of leave a li uh, my livelihood in the Midlands and go down and start working again as an electrician yeah. and not as a guitar player, you know. The, uh, just 
let me jump back for a second yeah. because you said while you were playing in the Midlands, yeah. you were playing both at clubs and you were playing at churches. Yeah. So were you playing the same music at both places, or were you or were you changing it up depending on the venue? You uh, were at? It, it like pretty much the same stuff. Like if people had booked um, my band to go and do an event, then it was the same stuff. You know, um, right. we used to do some covers as well, but original stuff. Um, but uh, if we were, if I was involved in the actual kind of corporate singing side of it, you know, the leading worship side of it, um, then they were different songs, you know, yeah. the um, songs that people knew how to sing and what have you, yeah. What were some of the covers that y'all did? I remember doing uh, Knocking on Heaven's Door um, and uh, we, uh, there was a period of time where I had a, a great friend, a guy called David Lyle Morris, he became our lead singer because um, I wanted to concentrate on playing guitar and um, he became our lead singer and he was from New Zealand and so uh, we used to do a lot of um, uh, like Crowded House uh, covers or um, In Excess we did and um, I mean, not all, yeah, 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 we used to do a lot of those Antipodean bands, you know, oh. and uh, uh, I remember we played Leicester Square Empire one day um, because of his connections, and it was called Anzac Day, which is a celebration of like their veterans, their war veterans, and um, from both Australia and New Zealand. And uh, there was two thousand Australian New Zealand kids in the Leicester Square Empire. It was wild. But we came round on this revolving stage doing um, uh, in excess. You know, um, oh, it's so good. Yeah. Great memory. So take us back down to the, uh, you know, we, we had our aside. Take us back down to the, the coast. And you're, you're becoming kind of part of a scene there because it's yeah. like you're wanting to be part of a, a group of people and uh, and you've you've gone back to a, a normal, you know, day job just so yeah. you can be part of this, you know, group of people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, if, if Martin and I and the guys were here talking, we'd, We'd kind of say, um, like, we didn't have any plans to become this really big band that travelled the world, but, you know, at the same time, there was something going on that kind of had a big feel to it. And so, in, you know, in my mind, I was thinking this could become something, you know. And uh, so it kind of made that worthwhile. And I think, you know, sometimes you have to go with your gut, don't you? Um, and your hunches and uh, and... You know, it felt like there was a door opening, and, and so we wanted to walk through it. Yeah. So the the band ended up, and correct me if I'm wrong here, the band ended up creating their own record label and their own kind of distribution and everything. We did, yeah. So, uh, and I, I I can't take credit for all that. Um, you know, I'm probably the least uh, businessman of all of them. But um, you know, it started this little event, and uh, Tim, the keyboard player, he owned a studio recording studio and Martin was an engineer. He, that was his career. He was a sound engineer, uh, recording engineer at, um, at a, a studio called ICC in Eastbourne on the South Coast. And uh, so they kind of like did a lot of projects together. And, and so, um, you know, as uh, the songs were coming together for that event, cutting edge event, we'd record them, you know, five or six at a time and make these little EPs on cassette. and. You know, they made 250 copies the first of the first one and that sold at the back of the hall and then that paid for the next lot, you know, and then that paid for the next lot and then we'd record another one and that would pay for the next recording. And so, and every time along the way, you know, there were companies that were um, keen to um, help us, you know, and, and as great as that is or, and that was, um, you know, whenever, when, when you come to talk about deals and you're, uh, you know, you might make a dollar on a cassette with a company, whereas you make, you know, five or something if you do it yourself. So it was like all the way along, it was sort of, why would we do that? Right. Why, why would we sacrifice to be with a major when yeah. we're making more money? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, and that wasn't like a, um, overly proud sort of thing to say. It was just a reality of what we were doing. You know, we were actually making this stuff ourselves and, and what have you. So it started really small like that, you know, 
Um, I remember the guys talking about their mother-in-law, you know, packing envelopes and they would be packing envelopes and posting them out. But um, as this sort of scene started to kind of get popular with the cutting edge stuff and we'd get invited out all over the country uh, to go and play at different events and um, and uh, and so you know it just started to grow and as it grew we just kept control of it um, and that's how it started and to the point where once we decided to go full time and uh, and become delirious we needed some help uh, with how to run it and um, one of the guys that Andy Piercy introduced us to introduced us to was a guy called Tony Pototo who worked for Total Records in London and was responsible for, um, right said Fred's I'm Too Sexy for becoming a worldwide smash, right? <laughs> Amongst other things, but that's the one I like to tease him about, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, like a guy that was working in a, had an incredible job at a record label in London, and but there was something about us that inspired him as well. And so he came on board and helped us form our record label and uh, and publishing company. And then later on, we decided to do our own distribution outside of America. Uh, so the rest of the world, we had our own distribution label called Fierce and we hired someone from uh, from Word Records in the UK and they came and, and ran that. And that guy is now living in America running Integrity Music. So. <laughs> You know, we're all still connected in some ways, but um, yeah, it all goes back to, you know, a group of us trying to find a new way that before the days of streaming and Napster and all that, we were trying to find a way to do things ourselves outside of the major labels. Yeah. Tell me about some of your, your kind of major guitar influences or musical influences. Yeah and how that kind of morphed into, as the band gets going, how it kind of morphs into an original guitar style. Right, yeah, I mean, everyone, no matter who you are, is a amalgamation of your influences, aren't you? You know, so like I said, at first it was Brian May, and uh, but I was always into like the more rock side of things growing up as a teenager, so, um, and, and, and experimental stuff. So Pink Floyd, um, Led Zeppelin, so David Gilmore, Jimmy Page, Brian May, I was really into Rush, um, so Alex Lifeson. So I would say like back then, um, before the new wave thing came in, it would have been Brian May and Alex Lifeson would have been my main sort of influences. But then when the police hit, um, you know, Andy Summers and what they were doing was just amazing and mind blowing. And then U2 came along and with The Edge. So um, The Edge is probably one of my biggest influences now, I would say. And I love that they've been going for 40 years or whatever. And, you know, I'm kind of jealous of that actually. Because um, uh, I wish that Delirious was still going, to be honest. But, right. um, uh, but yeah, like he's. Like the the way that they've just kept moving forward with, you know, he's so distinctive with his sound, and he's got that thing. But you know, he's kept moving forward and creating new stuff over the years. And then um, I remember in the mid '90s, uh, hearing the Bends by Radiohead for the first time, and that stopped me in my tracks, like hearing the Queen record for the first time. So. Um, uh, and there was something different about that. It hit me on an emotional level, like the, their music hit me really emotionally for some reason, and, uh, as well as just being impressed with technique or sound or whatever, you know, but um, yeah, it was like, it was almost a spiritual awakening as well. <laughs> Thank you. 
So how did those influences kind of, you know, come together, you know, for your own style of playing? I think, you know, through trying to copy them, you know, you spend time in your bedroom learning the stuff, learning how to play those songs, and then uh, um, you integrate them in, in. You integrate that stuff into your thing. I remember um, when we did a song called Did You Feel the Mountains Tremble back in the day, and uh, I had a PV valve verb, and um, on the on the on the valve verb you had the, the this tremolo effect. Um, that you had a speed control on. And I remember, you know, trying to get that thing like on the bends mm -hmm. uh, where it would go, you know, and um, but trying to get it in time was a nightmare and, you know, all that stuff. But that's just how it was back in the day, right? Yeah. I, you know, when uh, the Smiths did How Soon Is Now, I don't know how they cut that together. That was like, so it was in time. There's all sorts of stories of them uh, actually uh, run, you know, having their hands on the on the the speed knob and changing it during the song. Right, I'm yeah. sure. I'm yeah. sure that happened. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, tremolo will not stay in time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, drummers won't either, will they? Yeah. But. <laughs> so, now the the band Delirious had a, a huge impact on uh, on Christian music uh, because. It had kind of been more, for a lack of better words, performance oriented. And all of a sudden you had, it was more inner interaction and it became more, you were writing worship songs and you were doing these songs that people were singing along with you. And these songs start being sung in churches and stuff like that. Yeah. So tell us how that kind of took place. Yeah. You know, we started off by singing, uh, by, by, be in the band at this little worship event for kids, right? And uh, so that was always in the DNA. Then uh, we were trying to encourage people over the years as it kind of built up, because this thing grew so much to the point where we had 10,000 people on the seafront in Littlehampton, a tiny little town on the south coast, you know, and we did this open air event. And, you know, so this thing was really kind of growing. You know, discovering that faith wasn't just for Sundays or just for church, but you know, the whole of life, and um, you know, to kind of not just keep things into the in the walls of the church, but to you know, be an influence for good, the common good, you know, out out in the high street in our workplaces. And so, we thought, well, we, we're telling the kids to do this. Um, let's not be hypocrites. So we thought, okay. You, we need to be releasing songs in the charts and on radio in the UK. So, um, so to answer your question, we never saw a difference between music that was done in church and music that was done in the, in the high street. So right. we didn't want there to be like a sacred secular divide in that sense. You know, we kind of, someone in town in Nashville, a good friend, David Dark, he says, there's not a secular molecule in the universe, you know? So, um, we kind of had that sort of spirit where it was like we we did we tried not to divide um, up the sacred and secular, and so so we were trying to write songs that that communicated to folks in church, but also people that just walked into HMV too or heard us on Radio One in the UK, and so um, and it's kind of easier to do over there because there wasn't a, a massive Christian industry, you know, it wasn't a thing. So like um, if we were um, trying to release a single or something, um, it wasn't going to be a cheesy kind of Christian speak song. Um, and when, when, I, when I say that, I'm not being derogatory. It's just like what people perceive it to be, right? Right. Uh, um, it had to be as good as what you two were doing, or um, or Muse, or I'm just trying to think of our the people that were our peers back in the day. You know, so that's what we attempted to do. And we ended up having five top 20 singles in the UK charts. We had like number two in Germany and, um, and we played Glastonbury Festival and you know rock festivals around Europe and we uh, toured with Bon Jovi. Um, and we were doing songs, like if, if there's any Delirious fans watching, you know, 
when we toured with Bon Jovi, we would do songs like My Glorious, History Maker, um, you know, the songs that we would do at church events. We would do it and we'd, we'd see 65,000 people with their hands in the air, like just because it was a rock concert, you know. Uh, but there was something else going on, you know, like spiritually. So um, that's that was our sort of ethos. We, w- we would like try and do the same th- the same kind of bring the that experience of um, of worship to the mainstream world. And how were you received? I mean, I guess you kind of indicated that you were fairly well received, even touring well, with Bon Jovi. Yeah, we we were, uh, but at the same time, with a hefty amount of skepticism. You know, um, what's your agenda? People don't like to. Um, well, I think that sometimes Christianity is a stumbling block to people. You, know, you start, like, talking about faith or spirituality is fine. When you start to talk about Jesus, like, it's a little bit of a stumbling block to people. So, um, you know, but I think we, we our persistence and, um, uh, and just the fact that we didn't disappear, that was what paid off. And we had some great allies, um, like Q Magazine, uh, a great... M- mainstream rock magazine in the UK, uh, they seemed to like us, gave us some great reviews. Um, there was this actor in the UK called Neil Morrissey, who was very famous back then from, through a program called Men Behaving Badly. And um, Martin and I were mixing our Mesomorphous album in uh, LA with, uh, uh, Ocean Way with Jack Joseph Puig. And um, every day we'd go for a run along the 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 seafront there and uh, we bumped into this actor Neil Morrissey and got chatting because we loved his program you know he, he was really famous in the UK and so we connected and he used to like be our like ally in the press world and would talk about us and you know get on the phone with Q Mag or Radio One and uh, and and just be an ally so yeah it was it was we were um, you know, we, we were kind of seen with scepticism from both the church and the mainstream. Uh, people thought perhaps we were selling out or, you know, whatever, or the, or conversely we'd have some kind of agenda to convert the world or something, you know. But um, we were just trying to be authentically ourselves. Yeah. So then you end up influencing and, and kind of creating almost, well, you end up, changing a genre where all of a sudden you have Chris Tomlin and you have yeah. Hillsong and you have all of these bands that come up and that are kind of, you know, following along with what, what y'all started. Yeah, this, uh, you know, when people say that, that you were the inspiration for all this, I mean, it's very honoring for a start. Like that wasn't what we had in mind again. It just kind of happened, but we weren't on our own in that. You know, in the, in the UK there was what, what was really marking that period within the sort of church and youth world at the time was unity. So, you know, we would um, go to a city and play and there'd be all these churches coming together, you know, whether it's Catholics and, uh, and, and Charismatics and all sorts, you know, all kind of coming together to do this, these events. And, and out of that kind of experience came uh, something called Soul Survivor in the UK, which birthed... Um, you know, Matt Redman and Tim Hughes and people like that. And so, like, we would see very much that it was a, we were doing that together um, at the same time. It wasn't just delirious, you know. We were pushing the boat out musically, though. Um, uh, but that was because we, we felt the freedom. Because we weren't being told by a label what we had to do, we felt the freedom to do what we enjoyed doing, you know. So, um you know, the difference between King of Fools and Mesomorphous, for instance, was a real shock to people. Um, but, um, and that might have been to our detriment, but we don't regret it, you know. Delirious was, I guess, part of a movement yeah. that then created an, a, an, a greater movement. You know, right, a, a yeah. A shift toward, um, you know, worship music. Yes, and, you know, we're so proud of uh, people like Joel Houston, for instance, at Hillsong United, and, and Chris, and... Um, you know the the guys, and, and you know I'm just honoured to be uh, friends with a lot of these people, and also the people that have come up um, 
in terms of guitar playing, people like James Duke and Michael Pope and you know people that would kind of say that they were inspired by what we're doing. But also uh, there's folks in the mainstream. I, I remember hearing about Chris Martin coming to some of the early Delirious stuff in when we played Exeter. Or, and I don't know if that was a big inspiration or what, but, you know, then, then you've got Mumford and Sons, you know. Um, you know, so in some way, you know, hopefully um, there's been some kind of influence there for good. What are some of your favorite kind of delirious guitar parts? You know, would you play one or two of them? Of course, know? yeah. yeah. Um, so we went into a um, guitar store one day. I was with Martin, and uh, I saw this um, old Dobro hanging up on the wall and uh, got it down and, and played it. And... Um, the first thing I played on it was, uh, I don't, you, you don't know where these things come from, right? They just kind of appear at your fingertips sometimes, you know, but um, yeah, I'll show you what, what that played. It turned into a song called Investigate. But, so this would be one of my favorite guitar parts. So that was, that was one of my uh, favourite kind of chord sequences. And then, you know, I stomped on a uh, Zvex Fuzz Probe and uh, played this crazy fuzzy chorus thing. And, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so then the, the band, you know, unfortunately kind of came to an end. So, you know, what happened? Um, well, we were kind of all growing as families, you know, and um, Martin came to us one day and said, you know, um, I don't want to be away so much. Yeah. And so in the, in the midst of everything, um, you know, he's, he's like, I, I think I want to leave and do something else. Not saying that you can't carry on or anything like that. Um, and um, that was kind of the... the that was how it sort of started. And then yeah. we would talk about, do we carry on, do we not? And um, and I think in the best way that we could, we decided that um, that it was time to to finish and do other things. And and so that's what we did. Not, you know, as, as much as you kind of try and prepare um, and, and go through those things well, I don't think it's until after the fact, you know, whether you've done it or not. And I wasn't really ready for it, but, um, yeah. you know, like, um, Looking back, um, I'm in a great spot, you know, and so everything works out. But um, yeah, that, it wasn't a, uh, an amazing time for me. Yeah, I, I, I assume that it would be difficult to have a band that that you had helped birth, and then it, and then all of a sudden, yeah, yeah. So how did you move on? Um, with a lot of help, actually, and and a few mistakes. So, um, uh, but. I had, um, you know, that we knew that we were going to finish. And so every time we came to America uh, in our last year, um, I'd stay out for a couple of days and just sort of connect with folks in Nashville and LA um, and, and spend some time in different places and just see if there was a, um, a next step, you know, or something appearing. Um, I didn't really know how to... Um, uh, I, well, I, I knew that I didn't want to hang my guitar up, you know, and and so um, just in, in doing that, you know, made some great friends here and um, ended up with a publishing deal at Provident Essential Worship. And um, 
you know, that led to connections and, and I ended up starting something with Jason Ingram and Paul Mayberry called One Sonic Society. And um, at the same time as that, Michael W reached out and said, um, I've got this tour coming up in Europe, would you play? And so I did that, and then that led to playing on something called the Two Friends Tour in 2011 with Michael and Amy Grant. And, um, you know, little by little, all these things were sort of uh, coming into place, and I'd, you know, do the odd session here and there. And, um, and so in 2010, uh, my wife and I and our kids, we came over um, at Easter time, and uh, we were kind of looking to see if this was a next step and whether we should, you know, get an apartment or something or rent a place to to make us a base here when we were working here. And uh, while we were here, the, the volcano in Iceland blew up and stopped all air traffic going across the Atlantic, you know. And so we ended up being here for an extra seven days. You know, we'd already been here almost two weeks and, um, uh, and during that time we ended up buying a house. <laughs> <laughs> and th and that's how it kind of you know began. But um, you know I I feel even though it was kind of like I talk about it in the Beatitudes project because that was something that was a real catalyst for that those times and uh, um, you know I started to understand you know the f f not not to go into it too much but the first Beatitude is blessed are the poor in spirit you know and uh, so in my own way in, in in my own way, it kind of flipped my life upside down into that sort of, uh, my spirit was definitely not at its uh, healthiest and best, and, um, but it was a catalyst for understanding something about the words in the Beatitudes, and, and so I started to talk about that project here, and, uh, or the idea for the project, and that's when it really kind of took life during those times. So even though there was hardship there, um, some positivity came out of it, and I just, Heard someone say yesterday um, that, um, you know, God makes all things beautiful in his time. So let's, we're, we're going to talk more about Michael W. Smith and that, but let's, uh, you've mentioned the Beatitudes. So for those yeah. who don't know, what are the Beatitudes? Yeah, that's a great question. The Beatitudes are these eight announcements of blessing um, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. So the Sermon on the Mount is like probably the most famous sermon in the world. Um, Jesus spoke it, um, and it's in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, uh, um, uh, amongst other places. But And at the beginning of that uh, are these, um, these kind of eight blessings. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, um, etc., et because um, they don't sound like something you'd be blessed. No, yeah. exactly right. You know, and so um, I mean, I've like been diving into this for fifteen or twenty years, so I could talk for hours about this stuff. But just to say that the they're upside down, they're surprising, they're subversive. You know, if you're poor, if you're extremely poor or poor in spirit, like um, uh, there's just nothing left inside of you. You know, it could be a depression or something like that. Uh, they're not places where you'd think you'd be blessed, right? Uh, so this idea is that, um, the way we look at it, is that the blessing is presence, like the, the idea that God is on your side when these things are happening. And inside that blessing uh, is the invitation to be present. So later on it says, blessed are the merciful, for they should be shown mercy. So, you know, the invitation to show mercy, to become peacemakers, you know. And so, um, so there's this kind of, uh, upside downness, counterculturalness, you know, to the uh, um, to, to these things, the Beatitudes, and, and the project kind of explores that, and so it just says, you know, what does it look like now to be meek or to be poor in spirit or whatever, and so we filmed um, the stories of different people, and uh, I've got a load of friends like Michael and Amy and John Mark McMillan, Audrey Assad, Matt Marr, Martin Smith, Propaganda, uh, we we kind of listened to these stories and wrote songs, uh, right? Because you have songs. the interviews with some, you know, some of these people were like on death row, and and yeah. and then so from these interviews, then you collaborated with these artists and you and you produced the Beatitudes Project That's album. Right. Yeah. 
So. That's right. And so carrying on with the sort of delirious spirit in some ways, you know, wanting to take these kind of spiritual ideas and then put them in a way that kind of isn't offensive to people outside of the church or, you know, but just kind of an invitation into seeing what, uh, you know, the, you know, Jesus talks about I am the way. So what does the way look like? You know, it means getting alongside people who are poor. It means getting alongside the, those that grieve. It means showing mercy, becoming peacemakers. You know, it's kind of very simple in some ways. Um, but, uh, you know, I just wanted to put that in language that people can understand. So you're kind of hitting on it, but how, how has this changed the way you interact with other people? Um, I think um, there's, a, for me personally, there's an increase in empathy. There's an increase in uh, want, not being afraid to have the conversations of difference. And what I mean by that is, that, and, you know, another famous saying is, you know, love your neighbour as yourself. You know, Jesus said that, but who is my neighbour, you know? Right. Um, it could be the... Uh, the refugee that's just moved in down the road who's a Muslim, you know, like what does that mean for us, you know? And uh, uh, and of course it just means engaging, like and not tolerating, you know, like we engage people, we discuss, we offer them, like do you need some help? You know, it, it uh, that's with anyone, you know? So um, uh, these these things are all around us if we, anyway, so what has it meant to increase for me? Um, yeah, more empathy, Less judgment, uh, more inclusion. Um, yeah, peace and love, man. <laughs> I'm assuming this has been a, a fairly, uh, you know, a, this Beatitudes project. It's been fairly satisfying to be part of it. Absolutely. You know, I think that, um, you know, what we've got is a, we've got a book and, a, and an album and we've got a full length documentary film. We've got artwork um, that's been painted by two Nashville guys, Jimmy A. Begg, who's a guitar player in his own right, and uh, um, Corey Basil, brilliant artists. Um, we've got poetry, we've got all this kind of collection of stuff. Um, for me personally, I can look at it and say, this is a like a document of my, my own transformation, you know. Um, and, uh, and, and one that long may it continue. Stu, I asked you to get out the uh, the white sewer with yeah. the, with the humbucker in the back and the tremolo, yeah. so we could talk about Michael W. Smith. Sure. So you've been playing with him. You said you played with him back in in 2010, and then you yes. started on full time in 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 2014. Yeah. So I, I played on uh, with him every year since 2010. It just wasn't like every time you know I wasn't part of his full band all the time. Um, because of my schedule, actually. And then 2014 came along, and we did this um, a, a video recording in, uh, in his barn for a, an album called Sovereign. And um, uh, yeah, since then, I've been with him every time he's done a band show. And, you know, just to say about Michael, like, you know, you might know him as, like, this sort of uh, father of cr Christian music in, in America, but... I'd, like, he is such a great musician, one of the kindest people I know, and uh, incredible piano player, and, um, and he's constantly wanting to push things forward. And so his creativity is off the charts. 
you know. And, uh, and obviously, you know, his back catalogue is just this incredible music, you know, from the Change Your World album or Eye to Eye. And, um, and he, back in the 80s and 90s, you know, he just had the pick of the bunch in terms of who would play on his records. So, you know, you've got people like Dan Huff who has uh, who kicks my butt every night even though I've never met him, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I was going to ask you as far as, you know, when you're on a gig like that, yeah. and, you know, he has a career that's 30-plus years. Yeah. Uh, and he has, you know, and he has fans. Yeah. And those fans have listened to those albums, you know, over and over again. And so how much input does Michael put into it of wanting you to play what was on the record, which yeah. probably the fans want to hear, or yeah. letting you, because you're an artist in your own right, yeah. and letting you have some freedom? Yeah. So I think I'm in a privileged position because... I get to play on some of his new records, you know, so so that's where my, you know, Stu G as a player, his scratch gets itched in some ways because, you know, I get to help create some of the parts, you know. So, um, so that's fine. And then the other side of it is I actually want to, you know, the whole point of being a musician is to serve the, the artist or the band or the song, right? So, um, so I want to do that the best I can. And so... I remember someone saying to me years ago, Stu, you need to put, get, get yourself in situations that really push you from a technical or a you know, playing point of view. And so um, as much as I might get freaked out when I hear a solo like um, the um, Secret Ambition solo or Place in This World, for instance, they're two of the big ones, um, and it might seem like, oh, that's impossible for me. I don't play like that, you know. But the, the, the challenge is, can I? Because you're, you're right, the fans want to hear it. And uh, so I practice. Like when we're out on the road and we're doing, at the moment, we're doing something called the 35 Years of Friends Tour and we're doing a lot of those old songs. And so I practice every day. Um, I have to, you know, and because uh, I'm not like a, a natural shredder you know, and uh, but um, I work really hard at it, and uh, and and in my own way can pull those things off, so that people recognise them. You know, uh, I'm not just doing something uh, different to what they did on the record. I'm I'm trying to do it exactly. And so, you know, I'll put something into um, Ableton or whatever program I've got, and uh, sp turn the speed down so I can sort of hear what he's doing. And uh, the, the great thing about Dan Huff is that it sounds like once you get your head around what he's doing, um, it sounds quite familiar to me or I recognise the shapes and the patterns because um, I learnt the fretboard. Um, I went to the Guitar Institute in London, did a 10-week intensive there. And um, so I learned the fretboard. So, for instance, um, you know, looking at a major scale, for instance, you know, say, say we're in C and uh, position one using three uh, notes on each fret. You know, et cetera, and, and down again, and then starting in position two and three, four, five, six, and seven, that's how I learned the guitar. So, like, everything for me is based around the major scale. Even if I'm playing in, in a minor key or something, I find the center that is familiar to me uh, within the major scale and then, and then can play around that. And um, whether Dan Huff thinks that same way or not, I don't know, but um, that's how I got familiar with his shapes and his, his runs. Play a Dan Huff solo, if you oh. will. <laughs> We're going to okay. put you on the spot. All right. So, um, all right. So, uh, here is uh, a little bit of Secret Ambition. Uh, Thank you. 
<laughs> that was a little bit rovy, but <laughs> gives you an idea. I'm yeah. doing my best there. Yeah. So, so of course, also tone-wise, you're having to think. So, so obviously, you've, you're playing this type of guitar, which yeah. is what Dan would play. But what are you doing sound-wise to get more in the realm of yeah. of his sound? Yeah. So I, you know, I, I use a lot of. Uh, I like to have the amps uh, pretty clean. Um, and use pedals. So, you know, if I was to just show you the amp, amps on their own. You know, that's fairly clean. Um, so, I have my own pedal that I've made with JHS called the Kilt. Right, um, that's, that's based on the Xpandora. Xpandora, so I've, I have that in a um, kind of crunch mode, um, actually. So I have a little, like, Back in the in the early '90s, I have a little bit of uh, chorus and delay on there as well, right? So, so that's that. And then the kill uh, in crunch. And then I'll kick in the third power Roosevelt, um, which is an amazing pedal, um, really amp-like. Uh, so that that's what I'll kind of put on to add a little bit, right? A, add that extra sort of amp vibe. So, so to so to get kind of that '80s '90s vibe, you've got the Strat with the humbucker and the tremolo yeah. on it. You're using a certain amount of distortion, and you've got delay and chorus. Yes, because those exactly. kind of things that that and sometimes people don't understand how important the chorus along with the distortion and right. delay really kind of give it that smeary yeah. kind of. Uh, Kind of yes, tone. and yes. the snakeskin strap. Yes, obviously, but, <laughs> it's essential. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I, I have the chorus after the overdrives, um, mm -hmm. so that it's kind of like you say, it's kind of smearing the 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 sound post right. of the overdrives. You know, it's a little bit like mixing it in. You know, but um, uh, yeah, so it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> that delay's really nice. <laughs> <laughs>kind of already kind of dove into this but let's let's go full on into gear so okay uh let's let's you know first the uh the, the sewer so yeah uh, so tell us a little bit about the sewer strat obviously it's kind of a super strat with the uh, humbucker yeah. in the back but yeah. no locking trim no that's right so I, I got this guitar because we were um you know, I got, I got it maybe two years ago now, and uh, uh, we were going to start to do a lot more of the pop stuff with Michael W. And so I needed something that was versatile, that had the sort of power in the in the bridge and the trem, um, but that would still kind of do the uh, what you'd perhaps recognise more from the worship world. So I'll just show you something. Um, you know, putting it on the back pickup. So that was kind of a, a an instrument that you could cover both bases yes. with. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And Be uh, because before you probably would have tended to play strats, tellies, les pauls, and different yes. things like that. Not not really so much with a tremolo. And if it was a tremolo, it was probably like a big spear or something that's like right. that. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So um, you know, a guitar that I've used a lot is the Duesenberg Star Player TV. Right. Um, that I got like in, during the delirious years, um, because that was kind of best of both worlds in terms of like the Les Paul vibe, but then, you know, had that, um, had the, the trem and what have you. But um, yeah, so this is a great guitar. What I've done with it is, is um, that they they actually made a new scratch plate, load of scratch plate for me. Um, these single coils are the Landau 
the Sir Landau mm. single coils, and then the humbucker is a uh, Thornbucker, a Pete Thorn yeah. signature. Uh, and what's but what's different about the Pete Thorn pickup? Um, well, I just liked it better than the one that came on there. To be okay. honest, you know, I wanted something that was a little more um, smooth, but drivey, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and what we did with this is that we put push pull on the tone knob there, and it um, there's a difference between like splitting the coils and having them in parallel. So I don't exactly know the uh, technical jargon there, but this uh, puts, the, puts them in parallel or out of parallel, I can't remember which. Okay, but, and it uh, gives it more of a gives single it that coil single core sound. I'll, I'll show yeah. you what that, what it does, but so this is no, no effects on. So there's the uh, humbucker. There's the single core thing. Right. And you know, obviously you get that sort of out of phase. Yeah. Yep, it's great. Cool. I love this guitar. Yeah. Let's uh let's move on to the next one. Okay. Yeah. Th now this is one of your delirious guitars. It is, yeah. It's actually it's been my Frankenstein's monster over the years. Yeah. Um I bought it for 190 pounds. Um on my way down to recording the Cutting Edge 2 album. And um, so on that album, you know, I, I played um, Ebo on it and um, on all kinds of things, but, and it became the, uh, a, a real delirious signature sound for things like Did You Feel The Mountains Tremble and um, I'm Not Ashamed, uh, songs like that. Um, but over the years, you know, I, I, I kind of put the mirror scratch plate on it and I've had probably three or four different sorts of pickups on there, um, including that sort of uh, Johnny Greenwood uh, style super humbucker in the, in, the, in the bridge there. Right. Uh, you can see like some bad repairs where that was. Yes. And then, uh, um, you know, I've, I've changed nuts and tuners and all kinds of things, bridges uh, on it. So it's been that, that thing. But, you know, going back to what we were talking about, the influences, you know, um, Andy Summers being a big influence and how that, uh, Andy Summers and The Edge, I'd put them in a similar sort of ca category for me. Um, and uh, but there was a song called Feel It Coming On that this guitar, um, can I show you a bit of that? Yes, yeah. please. So, um, okay, so. And then the bit that's really Andy Summers. Nice. Yeah, so this, this has been a, a great, a, a really great tool over the years. So I use this with the Ebo a lot and um, something I learned from Phil Kagi was uh, to back off the treble and... Um, that, that helps tame it and it doesn't get, or oh, that really high stuff. Yeah, that, it tames it a little bit and, and it can be quite flute-like at that point or, you know... Um, You know, so I put a little bit of delay and reverb on it and it just kind of, and you, you can do those. Uh... Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's something that um, I used to do a lot with Delirious back in the day. Yeah. Yeah, let's bring the Ebo back. Yes. <laughs> yeah, this was a great one to drop down, uh, drop to drop D. This, uh, I love this Strat, it's one of my favorite guitars. Um, I, I used this on the Beatitudes project for this song. Um, so I found this on, on the H9, I found this kind of setting that is sort of a reverb, but it's kind of made up out of really short delays. So it kind of chops off at the end. And um, for whatever reason, I, I just like that sound and uh, um, love this this song. So this is a 70s Strat? Yeah. yeah. It's 70s, it's got the big headstock. I think it's 78, 79, around then. Yeah. Um, and it has uh, Bill Lawrence pickups in it. Uh, they're like vintage, uh, his vintage Strat style. Are they are they hum cancelling or are they single coil? Or? They're single coil. Okay. Yeah, they're not, they're not hum cancelling, but there's not a lot of hum here today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it really rocks too, so... Um, It seems like uh, the part of the heart of the, your uh, your rig is this uh, this gig rig switcher. Yeah, and you're you're kind of able to have preset uh, uh, you know groupings of, of pedals. Yes. Uh, let's just kind of give a, a little overview of the yeah. of the pedal board. It looks like you've got an expression pedal there, and that you've got a is this a second expression pedal? It is. It's for the two H nines. Do you want okay. me to just walk through this yeah. a little bit? Yeah, walk through it. So um, I basically come into the guitar, uh, into the pedal board through a, um, a, a buffer underneath called the Humdinger. That's by um, Gig Rig. Right. Um, I use the Gig Rig switcher, the G2 system. Um, I've known Dan for years and years and, uh, and love his stuff. Um, so I was, 
the reason I've, I've kind of landed this route is um, because back in the day I started to use a blend of two amps. And so I would use the, um, I would have the Palmer Tri-Line uh, isolated transformer, uh, like Y-Box, yeah. you know. And, um, uh, but there was no way of flipping the phase, you know, because I would, sometimes we would be flying to um, different countries or whatever, and I'd, you know, spec a, um, a Marshall and a Vox out. But that's, that was the thing, you know, it was like always a Marshall and Vox vibe. Um, but I was just kind of blending the sound. Um, and so I used to carry a speaker cable that had a, uh, that was phase reversed on one end. Right. You know, just, <laughs> that was my way of phase reversing the, the amps, you know. Right. Um, because if, if they're out of phase, it sounds hollow. Yeah. And it just doesn't sound right. And then it's like when you f have them in phase, all of a sudden, oh, it, everything sounds yeah. big and correct again. That is, that is right. So, yeah. um, uh, so this box, as well as it, you know, having a buff buffers built in and um, uh, and stuff like that, and everything being isolated, um, it also has a phase reverse switch. And so, um, with having that and the ability to to choose the different presets of the pedals, um, it's a no brainer for me. I, I love this. I love this box. But to show yeah. you the uh, people that perhaps don't know. What something out phase would sound like. So this is in phase. And that's out phase. But um, in the room, it, it kind of doesn't sound too bad. Just you've yeah. lost a little bit of bottom end, but um, yeah. it can kind of make you feel a bit dizzy. Yeah. And then it's back again. Just brings it all into the center. Yeah. Yeah. So continue on with your board. Yeah. So the first thing that. Um, that the signal hits is uh, the uh, compressor. Uh, it's a JHS Pulp and Peel version four. I love this circuit. Um, and, and that's a variation of the old orange squeezer. Correct? That's correct. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and then I come into my uh, full drive. That, and that, that's an oldie. It's an old one. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I love this pedal. I, I've used it all through the Delirious stuff. Um, it has this comp cut thing that I, I, is pulled up and I've got a bit of plastic underneath so it, it can't get pushed down. So you always have the uh, the comp cut on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I like the way that the, 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 the boost works. I know it's not really a, 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 a classic kind of boost right. thing, but it just kind of like ups the sustain and ups the overdrive. I love that. Right. Um, yeah, and then... Um, I have my kilt pedal. Which, um, that's based on the Expandora. Based on the Expandora. JHS makes. So yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a partnership with JHS. Love love that pedal. It it, it goes from crunch to fuzz, and um, I can through the switcher. Um, I can get a couple of different sounds. So for instance. Um, <laughs> So here it is in kind of crunch mode. But if I go over um, over here, you'll see the light change to red. And it's kind of like brought in a whole new level of gain. So, and that's just by switching these gain uh, knobs, but internally. So there we are, uh, that's the kilt, love that pedal and uh, really proud of it. So uh, there's that. And then I go, at, currently, you know, I, I interchange things in and out of here all the time, but um, uh, currently, especially for the Marcus W set, um, I have the third power Roosevelt on there. Is, is that a Mostortion uh, variation? Um, is that what that is, or is that a different circuit? I actually don't know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just love it. Yeah. So it, it sounds very amp-like um, to me. And uh, yeah, Delana has done an incredible job with this. And uh, and actually, you know, just to say that my when I'm using amps on my rig, when when I'm out with Michael W, I'm using third power amps. I have a uh, kind of a signature amp called the Majestic Forty, okay. uh, which is based off my uh, Park Fifty Watt Combo, that is my favorite amp in the world. Um, 
And uh, yeah, so that's that's really cool. So shout out to third power amps. Um, and then I come into, it, in the chain if you like, come into the prism, the Jackson Audio prism. Um, now I'm pretty much using that as a tone shaper. Uh, it's an always on pedal for me. And, um, uh, and you know, depending on, on which amps I'm using, sometimes I'm using Kempers. Um, that I, I make profiles with, with Tone Junkie TV. Right. Um, and, uh, but sometimes the environments with Michael dictate that we have silent stages, like when we're working with um, orchestras or, or whatever, so, um, or fly dates even. And the, the Kemper solution is just such a great um, option for me. Um, just super consistent, sounds like my amps, and, um, yeah, but sometimes you know your 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 gain stages or the EQs uh, doesn't quite sound quite right. Sometimes you're on uh, using different backline with different microphones, and uh, and so I use this as a tone shaper. Um, you know, I can adjust the, the the body and the and the top, and uh, even you know you can use it as a boost pedal if you want to with different EQ settings. This is a really versatile. And, and and brilliant tone shaper for me, so so that that kind of the the end of my sort of drive section if you like, um, and again you know I, I depending on which preset I choose, um, you know you the, these are turning on the loops, so I then come out of that um, I've got a the the pitchfork um, which I just use as a uh, an octave up. Um, I'll show you what that sounds like. You know, so um, it's great for the swells. Etc. Um, I have a uh, warped vinyl. Uh, pedal from Chase Bliss Audio, um, and that I'm using as a chorus pedal. Um, what's neat about that is that you can save some different presets on it. A little more out of tune. Yeah, and I love that. I love the. Yeah. I love heavy modulation. Yeah, not every producer does that I work with, but. So that's just a little more of a vibrato vibe. Uh, so I love. I love this pedal. It's brilliant. Um, then, oh uh, yeah, I've got the JHS. Uh, what used to be called the Pink Panther. It's now the Lucky Cat because they got in a little bit right. of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you can't use someone else's trademark. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but what I love about this is that it's a digital delay. Um, and so a little bit more like the TC2290 okay. vibe. Um, and again, it has different levels of, um, of modulation, which I absolutely love on this pedal. And, you know, if I could, I'd have my memory man and, you know, other things on here, but... Uh, I'll just show you this, uh, the, the, what I mean about the modulation. So, let's just turn this one off for a minute. Okay, so. I love that out of tune thing. I <laughs> absolutely love it. Um, okay, yeah. So the the Pink Panther uh, or the Lucky Cat, um, and then I go into my H nines. I have two. This one here on the left is doing reverbs and uh, and modulation. So it, it's my tremolo on something like this. Uh, and it's also the chorus in my um, kind of Dan Hoff tone, if you like. Um, 
it's, I don't have a Dimension D or, or anything, so um, I've, I use the poly chorus on the H9. Very subtle, you know. Um, and it's the... Um, it's the reverb in uh, in my ambient sounds. So if I was to turn the delay off, and I can bring up the So I use the uh, expression pedal for that. Um, and then going on to the, the other H9 is all delays. Um, and so I have like ambient stereo delay. And then this expression pedal is bringing up the the repeats and the uh, the feedback uh, to a point where on this particular setting it could be like forever. So, uh, too much fun. And a uh, great way to control them all. Yeah, so basically anything on, on here, these are the loops that the pedals go in, right. and uh, anything with the, the blue light on, uh, when I press, you know, a any given button there, um, is what is on, is what is in the chain. Like I said, five is uh, is the is the prism, and that's always on. Three looks like it's always on, uh, but it's actually turned on and off from there. And then uh, one is always on. I, I I do have the compressor on most of the time in my current rig um, because of the blend knob, um, and I just like that. Yeah. Tell us a bit about this Les Paul. Yeah. So this Les Paul, um, I talked earlier about. Um, working with Andy Piercy from After the Fire. And um, when we were making the Delirious album, King of Fools, he said to me, you know, Stu, I always imagine you uh, with a low slung Les Paul rocking out the front of the stage. And I've never had a Les Paul. And um, there's a guitar store in the UK called Chandler Guitars. And yeah. um, Doug Chandler and Charlie Chandler uh, two brothers that are amazing people and um, so Doug, I had a loner Les Paul from Chandler Guitars that was a cherry sunburst and uh, um, and we made that record with that with the guitar that was exactly the same as this except you know loner from Doug and uh, I was like I've got to have one and um, reached out to Pat Foley at Gibson Guitars, who was he lived in the UK at the time, and uh, ended up getting this one from Gibson, and uh, yeah, straight off the shelf. And it was uh, when I took it to different recording studios with different producers that, that play guitar, they would pick it up and like, this is one of the best Les Pauls I've ever played. So I got lucky with it. And uh, um, currently in in the the pickups here, I've, I'm using the third power mag frags. Um, I've still got the originals at home. Um, oh, it's also very dirty. So those are third power pickups? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know they were doing those. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're mag frags. So they have, uh, they're, they've designed it so that there's, um, I'm not sure that there's a magnet per pole piece, but it's kind of like, or it might be three magnets, whatever. So they kind of, you know, react with each other differently. And it's, it makes for a super clear, um, even at, when, when you're overdriving the amp, you can hear each string, you know. It's pretty, it, it's very good, very cool. Um, apart from that, it's, it's completely stock. 
And uh, so, you know, with Delirious, we did um, uh, a song called Promise on King of Fools, uh, for instance, that... It's a loud guitar, so I'm sorry about that. But, uh... Forgot my solo, but there we go. <laughs> oh, amps. Yeah. Tell it, you've got, it looks like you got a Vox and an Orange. Yeah, so um, when we were talking about coming to do this and yeah. I said, do you want me to bring my whole rig? You know, yeah. I was like, uh, my, my, an AC30 and my Park would have been amazing, but uh, it's just so big and loud for a small room like this. So um, I brought the AC15, so okay. I've got the Vox side of it. And uh, it's not Marshall, but this little orange AD15 is a fantastic amp. I love it. And so, um, yeah, I've actually used that on a couple of gigs too, you know. But, uh, so there we are. It's kind of, it, that's got that more Marshall-esque-ish sound. And then obviously I've got the Vox from there. Um, I had, uh, I used to have the blue, uh, the Celestian Blues in there, in the AC30, and I blew it up, and um, I had a 20-watt greenback um, lying around and put that in, and I haven't bothered changing it. It sounds so good. It sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stu, I really appreciate you coming down. This Thank is a real so pleasure to get to, you know, get you to tell your story and get you to show your guitars and the way you use effects and showing some of the, you know, parts that you played on Delirious Records. I, I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Zach. I really appreciate it. Yes. And uh, yeah, I hope, I hope people enjoy it. <laughs>